By the end of this video, you're gonna know the four main groups that I look for on your credit report when you apply for a mortgage loan. So you wanna know what the bank reviews on your credit report? Grab a pen because I'm gonna give you the answers right now so you don't have to wait until the end of the video. Later in the video, I'll explain these more in detail if you wanna know a little bit more about these particular topics. Let me be clear, these can easily reference any loan type, but for the record, because I know everybody's gonna wanna put their two cents in and I do appreciate it, this is gonna be a focus on the two most common type of mortgage loans, which are gonna be conventional and FHA. These will also be grouped up and answer a disclaimer, these are what I look for and my explanations are here to help you fill in some of the blanks. And as always, scenario, the scenarios always, they always depend on the individual. You ready? Here we go. The first thing, you guessed it, are gonna be credit scores. And that second group, or number two, the second thing I look for are gonna be bankruptcies, foreclosures, late payments, late payments on any mortgages, especially within the most recent 12 months. And number three, this group is gonna be the student, it's gonna be student loans, whether it's deferred and forbearance, defaulted, delinquent, and rounding this group up, number four, is gonna be tax liens, judgments, and collections. And if you're still watching this video, give a thumbs up and let's go into a bit more detail. So you might be asking yourself why I listed these items. Well, it's because these four groups can easily prevent you from passing go. You know, they also help tell me part of your story and also so I can ask you better questions. So this first, this, so number one in this first group, of course, are going to be credit scores. There are three main reporting agencies, which we're, I'm sure we're all familiar with, going to be TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, and uh, these are more commonly known as your FICO scores. Now, I know most of you have actually heard of uh, Credit Karma. Credit Karma is a great tool to use. However, Credit Karma only uses two of the three major credit bureaus. Credit scores on Credit Karma, they also tend to be slightly higher. Eh, but my, in my opinion, and from what I've seen, those two scores are typically in the ballpark. You might even get your scores from uh, your bank or a credit card company. You know, sometimes they offer some sort of credit protection or credit security where you can, you know, get your credit score. The problem here is you'll only be getting, you might be and most likely only getting one score. Now, let me give you a pro tip. This is super important here. Make sure you get all the knowledge you're looking for, which of course is to find out all the information and education it takes to purchase a home. So common sense should tell you that's going to include pulling your credit. You know, earlier I mentioned, you know, Credit Karma uh, only reports to two or three, two of the three uh, credit reporting agencies. Your own online bank, credit card company, possibly only one. That missing one or two agencies could lay reveal an unwanted circumstance. You know, for example, maybe a judgment or it wasn't disclosed at the time of application or maybe you simply overlooked, it happens. From speaking with different credit professionals, you know, creditors have the choice to report to whom they want to and not required to report to all three bureaus. It's a good nugget right there to remember. So keep in mind, the goal always, the goal always is to limit and minimize any surprises. So be prepared to pull your current credit report for a more precise analysis. Now for some of you, and you know who you are, it's because most of us actually been there at some point. May feel like your scores could be questionable. You came here to get what you want, to, to learn how to buy a house, so rip off that Band-Aid, don't fight it, and don't be afraid. Have your credit pulled. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's not the easiest you know, to let someone know your business. I mean, I get that. Whether you know them, you're, they're friends of yours, or they're just complete strangers. You know, especially if the credit is not good or Maybe should I say challenged? You know, let's be honest. You know, you know when your credit is challenged, are you, I guess the question is, are you willing to improve it? 
Now that question is actually yes, of course you're going to. Who's going to say no? I don't want to improve my credit. I like it the way it, where it's at. You know, the real question I think here is going to be what actions are you going to take? Be wise and be willing to commit and the rest, rest should take care of itself. So back to the scores. Let's go with a mid score of uh, how the banks view your scores. I'm going to go with a mid score of 740 and 740 is typically the benchmark for all the banks uh, at, that would be considered excellent scores. You know, I'm going to go down to say 620. Now, hold up, hold up. Don't change the channel because I know you've been told and watched a ton of videos that other lenders will accept scores down to 580, 550. Eh, while we're at it, why don't we just go down to 500? You know, although that it's not impossible, but when scores are you know below the 600 mark, you know, right off the bat, the credit is shaky and you know it and the lender knows it. But for some reason, they're still going to tell you, yes, we can go down to 500 and you have a chance. Well, the chance is very slim, you know, so I don't know why they tell you that. I mean, you know, there's a chance, like I said, maybe one out of a hundred. <laughs> I'm not I'm not being funny. I'm just being realistic. So you don't have to find out the hard way. Now we know your scores also, you also didn't get down there overnight. You know, so it's going to take some time and money, of course, to repair and also something priceless, which is time. So at this point, we'll immediately stop the application and start working out some alternatives, if there are any, to try to turn things around. You know, so for the example here, uh, in this video, we're going to go with a score of 740. 740 plus, is we're looking what the banks will look for and consider excellent credit, and the low being 620. So every nine to 10 points below that benchmark of 740, there's going to be an adjustment higher to the rate. Now, this could mean either higher costs or a higher percentage in rate. Either way, look, if you're scored at this, at this, uh, in this area, you know, the 600s, low 600s, most likely you're not going to be buying this home, you know, in the next three weeks. And it could be, it happens. Or maybe the next three to six months, even a year possibly before you're ready to purchase. At least at this point in time, we'll be able to put a game plan together to get you going in the right direction. There's really just no point in moving forward because you need that extra time to get your credit in shape. Now, this is the right way to do it. I understand that sometimes you know, uh, you have to find a house, your rent, uh, lease is ending or you know, some circumstance. But remember, you got to get in shape. You got to get a credit in shape. It's like running a marathon. You don't go right into the race, you know, straight out of bed. You know, you have to practice and train for months and months. And even then, maybe, just maybe, you might even finish. Look, any good lender is going to try to improve your current position so you qualify for the best mortgage terms. Make sense? That's a long pro tip. Now, so let's get back on track here. So three credit reporting agencies means you have three different credit, uh, credit scores. Earlier, I mentioned that, um, uh, that we're gonna go with a mid score of 740. Now the banks, that means every lender, every lender will take the middle score between all three credit reporting agencies. They don't use the highest, not the lowest and certainly not the average of all three take all three scores divide by three and that's your score it doesn't work that way it's like the story of uh goldilocks and the three bears you know they go with the middle score period here's a quick example just to give you a better idea if it's not clear borrower number one has a mid score of six of uh, 640 and borrower number two can also be the co-borrower uh, or co-signer whatever you want to call it the bar number two has a uh, score of 800. Who are we going to use? You guessed it. It's going to be the loan. Uh, the person who's uh, the loan is going to be qualified based on the middle score, which in this example is borrower number one with the 640. So it doesn't matter who you have front or who the primary is or the secondary is going to go with the middle score between both borrowers. Now this can be the difference between, you know, having the best mortgage terms and the not so good mortgage terms, you know, possibly have a higher down payment, uh, a much higher rate, that's for sure, and crazy high mortgage insurance. And that's also gonna depend on how much down payment you have. And all of this is gonna result in a higher monthly, higher unexpected monthly payment. All right, so let's move on to number two or this second group uh, of items that I look for. They're gonna be bankruptcies, foreclosures, late payments on any existing mortgages, especially within the most recent 12 months. Now, here's an example. If you have 
And here's what I'm uh, what I'm I'm going to try to explain what I'm talking about here. If you have one 30 day late, one 30 day late mortgage payment in the most recent 12 months, you might have a chance, and just really depending on you know your most recent 12 months of credit history as a whole, you know whatever that looks like. If you have any other late payments on any other obligations or collections within that 12 month period where you have that mortgage late it's likely that you won't be approved you know again the answer is it depends it depends on the individual's you know particular scenario you know if you have more than one 30 day late within the uh, most recent 12 months uh, that's a separate discussion comment below if you need that answer uh, so let's talk about a bankruptcy you know it's common it happens and with the way the market is right now well the job market i should say uh, you know, might be more, a lot of those are, are, are happening. You know, there's a lot more bankruptcies in 2000, in 2020 that there were in 2008, you know, so they happen and, uh, foreclosures, they happen. They're also per very personal, you know, so, you know, they may not even mention that, you know, Hey, I have a bankruptcy or I have a foreclosure simply because it's very personal and can be very scary. You know, so I think it would be safe to say that, you know, no one, you know, goes into a bankruptcy or a foreclosure, you know, goes into a bankruptcy thinking that, hey, look, I'm just going to file bankruptcy or intentionally wants to go bankrupt, you know, or they might, or they, if they have their home foreclosure, you know, that can be scary. Nobody wants to miss payments and lose their home, you know, so have, but also bankruptcy and a foreclosure doesn't necessarily disqualify you for a loan. However, it does change the scenario and different rules are going to apply. Yeah, I'm not going to go into uh, much detail about the rules of having a bankruptcy or foreclosure, but at the end of this video, when you have time, watch the separate quick videos that I put together where I go into more detail about having a bankruptcy or, for, or a foreclosure. You know, you'll learn the different types of bankruptcies, um, uh, for, different types of foreclosures, and yes, there are more than one kind of, you know, uh, of uh, type of bankruptcy or foreclosure. More importantly, you're going to learn what your options are and I guarantee to answer more of your questions. So you be sure to check them out. All right. So moving on to group number three or this uh, third group of uh, items that I look for on your credit report. Uh, these are going to be student loans, whether they're deferred, delinquent, uh, in forbearance or um, yeah, deferred, delinquent, forbearance, student loans. Uh, if you have student loans that you have a good idea of what this is, but let me clear this up and what this all means. You know, so in general, deferment lets you temporarily re reduce or postpone payments on your loan or loans. If you go back to school, uh, go to graduate school and get your master's or PhD or a residency, uh, if you're a doctor of some sort, you know, they may be deferred and you don't make payments yet. Meaning at some point you will be making payments. You know, here's an example of how this could really affect you and your application on a, uh, if you had a student loan balance of $30,000, that would come up out to be 150 to three, $300 added to your monthly debt ratio. That would re result in a lower purchase price and your approval possibly being denied because your debt ratios are too high and a forbearance it's close to the same thing, you know, except the interest on uh, the amount you owe increases. Forbearance, it stays the same. For uh, uh, Deferred stays the same. Forbearance, it, it, the balance increases. And delinquent is if you miss your payments. And if you miss your payments, you need to get them caught up. Default, that's what that means. Default means, you know, uh, that you miss your payments. And generally, these are sent to collections. There's a lot of scenarios that this could play out and a lot of extra work that goes into it, you know, if these are discovered on your credit report. So, but however, these will actually, you know, stop you in your tracks. And if you try to apply for a mortgage, they pull with a cavers, a cavers number and your name is going to come up if you are delinquent, but check out the playlist and I'll show you how to calculate payments on deferred student loans and no, it's not just that 1% or half percent of the balance. There's actually a calculation that Fannie Mae released and it could help you, especially if you have high student loan balances, say, <clears throat> excuse me, within a 60 to $100,000 balance, you know, and student loan balances of that amount and add that with what times that 1% for a payment, that's, that significantly reduces your chance of being approved. 
you know, and also I'll show you, uh, you know, how to, what steps to take to get your delinquent student loans out of collections. Whew, and rounding things up, <clears throat> before we get to the fourth group, or number four here, I've helped, if I've helped you fill in some of the blanks, even just a little bit, and maybe you've found, hopefully you found some value, please hit the like button so others can help, you can help others find the right answers. All right, so let's wrap this up with number four. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tax liens, judgments, and collections. Tax liens are the most commonly known ta uh, tax liens or the more commonly known, more commonly known than any other tax lien is owing Uncle Sam, also known as, of course, the IRS. These can show up on your credit report, and this usually tends to be, uh, but not exempt to, not, not uh, only, these tend to be um, self-employed borrowers, whether they're 1099 employees, those who file Schedule C's, uh, 1120s or 1065 each year. You know, it's okay if you don't know what these are, but if you actually use these to file your income taxes, you know who you are and these will apply to you. Now, why are these important? Just like student loans, these are government entities. And if you know anything about our good old government, they're first in line and want their money before you can get a mortgage. It's also a show of responsibility on your part to bigger things like home ownership. Now, does this disqualify you for a loan? No, <laughs> it's not necessarily. You know, but it does put a kink in your process and could delay you know, your application or pre-approval. Now, it also depends on if you're willing to resolve the issue. The <laughs> very first thing you don't want to do is neglect it. Like I said, those guys go get their guys get their money. Uh, Uncle Sam gets their money anyway, and if they'll you know take your checks or take it out of your bank state bank account. You know, but the option here is to probably get into uh, an installment agreement with the IRS. And this, once again, that IRS monthly payment that you negotiate can, you know, can reduce the amount of home you can buy or um, uh, deny your loan application simply because we have to add in that monthly payment against your debt to income ratio. So as you can see, these points that we went over can totally cause you know, a lot of headache. I struggled through some of it here because there's just so much, but it still doesn't disqualify, necessarily disqualify you, you know, from buying a home. You just have some extra work to do. Most customers that I speak with will trust my direction and follow through. The ones that don't, just aren't ready to commit to change. Just not right now. And I give the best direction to everyone that I meet with in the end, you have to be willing to make the change. I hope I was able to fill in some of the blanks. Don't forget to check out the other videos. Uh, I'll go into more where I go into more detail with just about everything and answer all the questions you might need to know to have you to help have you have a better mortgage experience. I have to say it once again, if you found some value in this video and I was help, uh, able to help you uh, answer some of your questions and fill in some of the blanks, please hit the like button and consider uh, and consider subscribing. Thanks, and f thanks for your time. Hi, Mackenzie.